Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Randy Gerber, and happy to be here to host uh, our, our our panel of experts on what to do next in the restaurant industry. Um, a few housekeeping items that, if you could leave your questions in the chat, we will address them at the end. Um, and happy to, to take questions, and you can enter them whenever you wish. Um, so everybody here, and I'll let everybody introduce themselves, um, has, has, is an entrepreneur or works with entrepreneurs uh, uh, themselves and have a unique focus and tie to the restaurant industry. And obviously the restaurant industry uh, more than most, I think, uh, has been hit hard and, and forced to innovate and forced to change. And uh, we know that what was necessarily won't will be going forward uh, as an industry. Now, maybe there's uh, specific restaurants that are able to do exactly the same as they were before. Uh, and I, I'm saying restaurants, I probably should say restaurants and hospitality because I know we have a, a brewery here with us uh, as well today. Um, but anyway, that we know there's gonna be change in the industry um, and just the labor market by itself is forcing some change. So. We want to talk about what uh, and, and, and client experience and client expectations. You know, the, the, I think uh, COVID has has permanently changed behavior with some people and and changed expectations with some people, and so therefore it's going to have some forced change in the hospitality and restaurant business as well. So before I go any further, because I can talk by myself for the entire hour if you let me. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce everybody here, and I'll actually said differently, I'll let everybody introduce themselves. And uh, a familiar face to all of us is, is Kaz, who's been here a few times. And so Kaz, why don't you tell us who you are and yeah. where you work and what you do. Okay, thanks Randy. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Kaz Unlin. I'm a tax partner at GBQ Partners. Uh, we're based here in Columbus, Ohio. We're the largest independent CPA firm um, with also offices in Cincinnati, Toledo, in Indianapolis. And uh, as Randy kind of mentioned, I co-lead our restaurant group. Um, so work with restaurants of all sizes, shapes, um, lo locations, uh, you name it. So uh, happy to be here today and excited about uh, the panel discussion. So thanks. All right. I'm Mark Stansbury. I'm the founding partner of Stansbury Weaver. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're a law firm that Sports entrepreneurs of all different kinds in opening businesses, raising capital, protecting IP, handling all the things that entrepreneurs regularly come across. My personal focus is on helping companies raise capital and on providing general counsel services to entrepreneurs and startups. James Kosh, I'm the CFO of Land Grant Brewing here in Columbus, Ohio. I'm responsible really for all things money. Um, as Randy said, the restaurant and hospitality industry, we've been hit really, really hard. So. Um, Managing through that was arguably the toughest portion of my entire career, but I um, was able to make it through. So happy to uh, discuss it with all. Uh, and I'm Stephen Harmon. I'm a founder, co-founder of Fusion. We're a 12 <coughs> unit uh, sushi restaurant based here in uh, Columbus and uh, Ohio. We have uh, a few locations in Cincy, Toledo, Columbus, and Dayton. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Randy, for hosting. Hopefully we can add a little value. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm excited. So James, uh, your introduction caught my attention um, in in terms of the hardest part of your career. Yeah. And so can you can you kind of expand perhaps? I, I want to spend our time in the future, a few where things are going, but I do want to hear from you why you said that's the hardest part of your career. Uh, because <laughs> coming from a large scale um, in my previous career, coming from large scale corporate America and then coming into a, a smaller business and being able to not only keep headcount on, we didn't know what the future was. Uh, everybody really felt the pinch. You, you were living day to day, essentially. So um, just kind of managing through that entire process and managing through, you know, cash, cash was king during COVID. So just managing through all of that, it was a uh, it's very tough, but hey, we made it through. So we're here standing. So, you know, the, the cash is king, yeah. is a generalization. Um, money can't make you happy, but it certainly brings happiness. Sure. Um, where do you guys see money going in the future? So, you know, for all of you that with with as you're expanding your 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 business and expanding facilities and locations, where's the money coming from in the future, you think? Well, it's an interesting time. I mean, money 
is in a way never been more available than it is right now. But it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. It's certainly if you're, uh, say, improving the technology of your restaurant or trying to roll out a, a new tech idea or tech focused restaurant, money is going to be available. Uh, you may have to do a little bit of work to find it, but it's out there and ubiquitous right now. Uh, if you're starting a new, entirely new sort of brick and mortar traditional restaurant, it may be a little harder to come by, you know, that the, um, money seeking higher returns right now, but it is still out there. Uh, there's still a lot of different sources and we could talk about those if you want to be. Yeah, yeah, so, so what, what are those sources? Yeah, so, so there are three basic types of capital that are available. There's uh, borrowed capital, permanent capital and grants, which are, you know, could consider a subset of permanent capital, but worth calling out separately in this particular instance, because uh, grants have gotten so much popularity due to the restaurant revitalization fund and state initiatives to provide grants to restaurants uh, coming through COVID and trying to prop people up. Uh, cash has been tight, as James mentioned, and James can get a little more into the grants. He's gone really heads down into the legislation and sort of outlawed the lawyer on that one. So he can, <laughs> he can uh, update everyone on that. The two more uh, stable and common types of capital that are available, borrowed and permanent. Permanent capital is uh, equity investments. So what you think about just uh, raising money from investors. The most common for restaurants, the most common source of that is friends and family. Uh, not everyone has access to friends and family capital, but if you do, and your extended network, that's the best place to start for some seed capital to get things going, open the doors, um, start operations. Usually it's not enough to get going, but it's worth the start, uh, first shot. Other places that are sort of somewhat cutting edge and uh, places where you can find innovation, uh, crowdfunding, so reward-based crowdfunding, where people put money in early into your venture and you give them early access or discounts or something like that exchange and then equity crowdfunding where people put money in and actually are purchasing equity in your company equity crowdfunding is heavily regulated so if you're going that route be careful and you know, tread lightly but it is an opportunity and it seems to be more successful with uh you know sort of popular um popular businesses that generate buzz like a restaurant something like that that are very consumer facing and that people really affiliate with um another We'll see where it goes. Cutting edge thing. It's non fungible tokens. Everyone's talking about these. So, now. so Mark, before you go there, I do have a yeah. question. So, so how much money have you actually seen raised through crowdfunding? I mean, we're we talking millions of dollars, talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands. What? what yeah. So it's usually going to be tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars um, on the equity crowdfunding side. In full disclosure, we have had zero because the hurdles are so high. We've had tons of conversations with entrepreneurs about it, but no one ever moves forward. We have a client in the process right now, but his his example, this is a tech company, but his example is why no one is moving forward. It's, he keeps getting it kicked out. He's got to get audit. He's had to hire a bookkeeper to correct his books and he's hiring a CPA to correct financials. And then he's hiring another CPA to audit the financials. And this keeps getting kicked out and out and he's not going to be able to raise that much money because your limit is just over a million dollars now it's taking up with inflation but it's not a lot of money for the work whereas as i mentioned earlier capital's available so if you can go out and find one person to cut that check that's a lot easier right and a lot less regulation fewer disclosures just less red tape around that. right so right the crowdfunding the the uh reward-based crowdfunding seems a lot more popular and a lot more successful, but you're still talking about smaller amounts. Yeah. So you're not raising millions usually do that. Got it. So the non-fungible tokens. Yeah, so non-fungible tokens are a hot topic right now. Um, so that is, I, I think about, it's, it's kind of blue ocean, figure out what you want to do with it kind right of. now. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally, totally blue ocean. Um, but the possibilities there look a lot like reward-based crowdfunding in my opinion, except that the, the purchaser has something that they can resell, which is a token. So if it were like a VIP access token, um, you know, the restaurant's got to find a way to be able to verify that. And like, there's a lot of technology that the restaurant has to implement to actually do something with this. But particularly for early movers, it could be a way to generate some buzz and raise some capital. Have you guys seen anybody do this yet? Not yet, not in the restaurant space at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, when you see, you're seeing these things start to proliferate and we've had conversations with people about doing this in different spaces with art. Certainly you have like NBA Top Shot is right. sort of the marquee case, but I I think that there's 
it's one of those industries where it's going to be a lot of buzz, a bubble, and it's going to taper off. But some of those will be successful. You, you can imagine there are restaurants in the world, perhaps even in Columbus, where if you had a token that lets you have some kind of special access, yep. chef's table, whatever, something like That's that. That's interesting. I never even thought about then that. You'd be able yeah. to, to end, and as the restaurant increases in popularity, the holder of that token could transfer it to someone else. Yeah. So they actually have some asset that they could be useful. I, yeah. You know, like most of these things, the majority of them will not be valuable over the long run, but it can still help the company get capital up front. I should probably get a non fungible token on Cameron Mitchell. Yeah. Just tell them that I have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Actually, I'm not even joking. Cameron, guess what I have? Uh, so. <laughs> um, James, so talk to me about grants. Uh, yeah, so kind of the hot topic right now is the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Um, that is about out of money. It was $28.6 billion, and it truly was a hard and fast grant that you could use for any really operational expenses. Right now in Congress, they are trying to get more into the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Uh, they're looking for $60 billion. So um, write your senators, you know, talk to anybody that you know try to get more money into this because it is vitally important for a lot of industries and it's really helping a lot of um, a lot of restaurants bars really anybody in the hospitality space another one if you're based here in ohio is ohio house bill 108 which was signed into law last month there's not a lot of legislation around that right now um, really just kind of waiting on the rollout of what that is but it's a grant for ten to thirty thousand dollars so stay tuned on that what Ooh. How do you qualify for this for the the grant? Uh, the restaurant revitalization yes. fund. So if you are in our space, uh, being a brewery or a bar, thirty three percent of your revenue had to be from on site consumption. You couldn't just be a wholesaler, um, or you had to uh, to have a revenue loss, which most of us have had <laughs> revenue loss. So right. yeah, got it. Okay. Is there a limit to does any restaurant qualify for this? Do you know, or is there you had to have, I believe it was 20 or less locations. Um, so you couldn't be a large scale multinational chain. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, Stephen, how'd your business fare through this whole thing? You guys are in that fast casual space ish a little bit. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think James kind of, kind of, uh, made a great point when he said it was day to day there for a little while. So, uh, March, April, kind of when some of the mandates started to come through, you know, we were, watching every watching every broadcast kind of figure out what's next what's next what's next you know for a couple of weeks it was uh it was a little scary uh we got to a point where it was like do we close down for two weeks or do we keep going um and by the time we had to make that decision we kind of saw the curve shift a little bit um people started getting more comfortable and quote the new normal grocery stores kind of caught up a little bit and the reality for our business is people don't make sushi at home generally. And so um, we were able to create a lot of, uh, a lot of um, value, probably re-engaging lapsed customers who hadn't been in for a while um, as the world was going normal. And then also uh, because maybe some of the more independent owner operator, kind of more fragmented restaurant groups closed, uh, allowed us a chance to, to, to level up. Um, but it was a little touch and go there for a little bit. But as as the year kind of went on, as more information came down the pipe from from uh, the government, local and state and federal, uh, we were able to, to, to keep on chugging. And, and ultimately, uh, I think we 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 became galvanized and a lot stronger through COVID as an operating group. So, um, you know, it's interesting what COVID did for America and and one of the positive uh impacts was the forced innovation right that it, it forced us all to change in some way shape or form uh let me rephrase this it forced us all to accept change whether you liked it or not you had to accept it and and those companies that that embraced change and were able to innovate and i know that you had some innovation in your business around your app and, yeah and, and talk to me a little bit about um how that has impacted your business today and also wh where it's going. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we quickly realized that the supply chain from uh, grocery stores, grocers and restaurants were, were totally different. Um, 
and food that was coming into restaurants was not the same food that was going into to grocery stores. If you can kind of go back a year ago, uh, 15 months ago, it seems like forever ago. Um, and grocery stores were overwhelmed. They were running out of things. Uh, they were running out of toilet paper. They were running out of fresh produce. Uh, we said, we have access to all this stuff. Our produce house, you know, was stocked to the gills for March Madness, for St. Patrick's Day. We said, all right, we can sell this stuff. Give us your bananas, give us your oranges, give us your toilet paper, give us whatever you're trying to move. And we basically put together a on-demand restaurant del or grocery delivery platform with on within our app, um, which allowed it, was, it, was, it allowed a lot of things. One was we got good press because of it, because no one else was doing it. Two was our employees were able to keep their hours, which was very important to us. We wanted people to be able to have a place to go, have a place to work, uh, get their paychecks. And then third, uh, you know, it gave uh, people a way to shop at Fusion in a little bit different way. So, you know, maybe they wanted their sushi roll, but they could also throw in a pack of toilet paper. They could throw in a pack of, uh, you know, six bunch of bananas. We had ramen noodles. We had, you know, kind of the stuff that was uh, was was trending again um, during during COVID. So, uh, that was a way for us to direct the message to our customers and ultimately create additional value on top of the value we were already trying to create with 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 uh, custom sushi rolls. So uh, from there, uh, we were able to almost double our app user base just through buzz. We did some incentives, we did some, uh, some loyalty uh, type credit onto the app, um, but ultimately basically became a platform for people to explore, experience fusion in a multitude of different ways, whether it was food, whether it was sushi, um, whether it was you know promotion that we were doing. Uh, we had reached out to a lot of local companies uh, in each market that were kind of in our same realm. We sold Taste of Poetry and Waffles in Cincinnati. We sold Killer Brownies out of Dayton. And some of these local kind of uh, staples that people had gotten used to eating in normal times, we would bring in and, and, and resell, uh, which ultimately became a win for us, generating revenue, keeping employees hours, became a win for our customers because they were getting something they were used to eating. Um, and it was a win for us because you know we could, we could create more value on the platform. So, the app really allowed people to transact with us no matter where they were, office, home, without necessarily coming into the restaurant because we were able to deliver. Are you still doing the grocery delivery? Uh, we're not doing the grocery delivery. Um, as grocery stores, at, at its peak, it probably made up 10% of sales. Maybe that was for a couple weeks, a grocery items specifically. Um, as, and during that time, you know, you were booking pickups for from Kroger, Giant Eagle, that was taking, you know, sometimes three to four days before you could pick it up on the curbside. Delivery was even longer. So we really capitalized in short term. We're able to gain a lot of users to our user base. And then, uh, you know, ultimately grocery stores picked up. We ran through the supply chain in our produce houses and, uh, you know, the world kept going on. So James, how about you guys? What, how does, how did you innovate through this process. Yeah, so similar to uh, Stephen's point, um, we had to really rethink our entire business model. Bars and restaurants were shut down for nearly three months, and we really had to think on our feet. You know, how do we still get beer into consumers' hands when they can't just go to their local pub or go to a restaurant to get our beer? So we came up with two things. Um, we came up with a home subscription model. So. We would curate basically a box every month. You could sign up and you would get right to your doorstep a case of beer every single month that would be new and fresh. Constantly, you would still kind of get that, that kind of brewery experience just from the comfort of your couch, essentially. And then the other thing we came up with was um, kind of doing virtual tastings where you, could, you couldn't be with your friends, but what you could do is sign up for a virtual tasting led by one of our brewers or led by somebody from the brewery where you can still get that uh, intimate kind of brewery experience with your friends just over zoom do you think they'll do virtual tastings in the future potentially i mean well we're still seeing it for a lot of companies you know they want to get together for a happy hour but they're still not in the office at this point so they're still going through that so we're even, still even when everybody's back in the office yeah i mean um i think it would be a good way if friends are spread throughout the country or something like that they, they could kind of at least have that so okay. I, I believe it's it's here to stay so Kaz and Mark, do you guys, um, with your client base, how many do you see that are innovating as a percentage and how many are not? How many are going back to their old ways? And that's not a bad thing necessarily, I'm just kind of curious, like what are you, what are you seeing with your client bases in terms of innovation? 
I mean, given our particular client base, it's pretty much everyone's innovating. We tend to work with uh, startup and tech focused companies. So they're all, you know, whatever industry, across any industry, they're all innovating. So got it. It's a pretty easy answer for us. Good. Yeah. I think same thing. I mean, we're seeing innovation across the board uh, with our restaurant clients, you know, in terms of ordering and delivery and that sort of thing. I think one of the other things that we saw early on was really getting back to the basics too in a big way. Um, you know, the discretionary spending, um, looking at locations and maybe weren't performing well before the pandemic and making some tough decisions there that actually probably should have happened before this. Um, so it was a combination of a lot of things just to, you know, like these guys said, just to keep the doors open and and uh, get to the other side of this. So I was with uh, um, my good friend Troy Allen yesterday and he told me who owns Pins Mechanical and told me that uh, uh, they're at 100% of 2019 revenue numbers, but they're still 85% of the labor force and they're having a tough time finding people. And uh, my question, I, I think I know the answer before I ask it is, are you guys experiencing that same problem, finding people to work? And if so, how are you solving for it going forward? We're not actually. Good. Um, I know the secret sauce. Of, besides your good looks. I think this, I don't think that's secret. the secret sauce it was that we never closed. Um, we showed a lot of appreciation to our team throughout throughout the entire last 15 months. We didn't have to lay off any anybody. Nobody lost their hours. We were able to keep hours. Um, and ultimately, you know, in retrospect, we've, we've heard a lot of people saying, like, thank you for being there. Thank you for giving us a place to go. Thank you for keeping the paycheck rolling. Um, and you know, we have a standing call with the entire company every Tuesday. It's a pretty intimate, you know, it's a pretty intimate organization when it comes to, you know, open communication. In the restaurant industry, there's this kind of, this kind of misnomer that it's just a high turnover industry. You know? uh, we, we kind of feel differently about it in that people don't leave the restaurant industry. They just leave your restaurant and they go to another restaurant. And so if we can That's be the, point. if we can be the best place for people to, to work, you know, we're clean, we're fast, we're friendly. We don't, you know, we're not working under a hood with grease fryers, flat tops, grills. You know, we're very, we're very clean and we're a very positive work environment where we, we can come to work pretty prepared every day. Uh, it's not, we try to make it not a very stressful environment. Um, How do you do that? By being prepared. So, you know, we have, we run, we run our company shift to shift. So two days, uh, twice a day, we're looking at sales, we're looking at labor, we're looking at, are we prepared? Do we have enough food prepared? Uh, the reason why restaurants can be stressful is you're busier than you thought you were going to be. And you don't have enough food. You run out of food. You're making stuff on the fly. You know, you don't have enough staff. People don't show up. Uh, and we just, you know, when things get hard, we try to make them less hard. It's something that was taught to us by uh, a partner of ours, Mike. And uh, and uh, we just try to make things less hard. That's really interesting. That's a, I think it's, a, uh, I want to say this without frustrating people um you, you know there's a certain population of our labor force that definitely doesn't want to be stressed out and yeah. and i think all of us have to me included uh have to learn how to to reduce stress in your work environments you know, if you want to be able to employ across the entire labor force one of the things we've been seeing too which is you know interesting is is you know you're seeing people saying hundred dollar signing bonus three hundred dollar signing bonus start today you know open availability hours now hiring and then you see, you see restaurants and, and businesses doing that and you hire somebody for three and you give them a $300 check. What does that message say to the rest of your staff that's been busting their ass for the last right. year? Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's going to want to get in on that. And it's, it's a really bad, uh, in my opinion, yeah. it's a very bad kind of precedent to set with your teams that you can be bought and sold. Uh, we believe in merit. We believe in hard work. We believe in, um, you know, personal and professional growth. And I think that uh, through that, we've been able to retain and attract a lot of a lot of people, not only through the pandemic, but over time. Um, Carly, our director of operations, has been with us for 10 years. She's done every job in the book. And, uh, you know, it's people like her that, that allow people to see the vision of growth through the company. So, yeah, knock on wood, um, we've been able to create a, a culture that's, around, that's, that's kind of based on performance, but Good people want to be measured, and we're, and we're finding that to be kind of a universal truth through good times and if they're stressful. That's good. That's really interesting. James, how about you? How are you guys faring 
Um, similar to Stephen, I mean, we were able to hold on to a majority of our workforce during COVID, but uh, kind of the push right now is to get uh, people hired because there was a lot of pent up demands. So we're seeing, as you said, numbers that we haven't seen before, but it's hiring the right person. You know, people haven't been out and about sometimes for 15, 16 months. So to have that first experience kind of back into the world, so to speak, you, you want to make sure that it, it's a good experience. You want to make sure that the people that you hire are not only trained, but friendly, just making sure that uh, they're on their P's and Q's, so to speak. So that's kind of our push is just to not necessarily just hire a body, but make sure it's the right person. Right. It's interesting. I, I, I've said this for a long time. I think Kaz and I, when we talked about this, I mentioned it that, that, you know, as we know, the labor market was in motion last year because it was forced to be in motion, right? People were forced to lay people off or furlough folks. And I believe that the labor market will continue to be in motion because uh, people want to align with employers they want to work with. I mean, more than ever, they, they, they learned from COVID that, hey, I, I don't want to do this. I want to do that, whatever it may be. And I think that uh, and the employee is far more empowered today than they were before because the governor gave them that power, right? And say, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not doing it. Um, and so uh, it's something that all of us are going to, I mean, we're embracing it because we're, uh, you know, we had somebody leave recently who just didn't like the, the intensity um, when it's all said and done and they're going to a place that's much less intense. Um, and, but we picked up some great people who love the intensity and that's, you know, we're, we're looking for folks like that, FYI. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't mean that that wasn't in my head, but here we are. But anyway, I do believe the labor uh, market will remain in motion and you can really align the right people with your value system and your business, what you're trying to accomplish. So, so I'm going to change gears a little bit. Uh, Kaz, um, you know, uh, every day there's news about this tax law change and how it's going to either save the world or ruin the world. Um, and uh, I'm kind of curious, number one, what do you, and this is an unfair question, I know. Sure. What do you think will actually happen? Okay. And then the second piece of that is, when will it happen? Okay. So I think um, maybe just to give a little bit of perspective. So what what may be coming down the pike, I made a note here. I think early on we said, where's the money coming from? And I think this may be where some of the money might be going <laughs> from a tax standpoint. Um, everything, and, and again, there's been a lot of changes the last, I don't know, call it 16 months. There's been three or four different tax bills. I mean, we talked about some of the things out there already with the revitalization grant, PPP, we haven't touched on, I don't think we need to, but that's been out there. The employee retention credit that's refundable, um, the list kind of goes on and on. And, and I don't think it's gonna let up anytime soon. Unfortunately, I think where the kind of the headwinds are, are going now is kind of more on the political side and some campaign promises in terms of, um, you know, kind of where tax law is going. Um, I think at this point, I don't, I don't see anything getting any, the environment getting any better, probably only worse, uh, meaning rates are going to go up. A um, couple of the proposals, and I'll hit on Randy's question kind of when maybe, but a couple of the proposals that are out there right now, um, raising the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%. Um, not many of our clients are corporate entities, but we do know there's a lot of legacy restaurant clients out there that are something to keep on your radar, um, increasing the individual rate from 37% to 39.6% is out there. Um, the big one, um, we we're kind of talking previously, there's still a lot of M&A activity out there and we're even seeing that in the restaurant space, um, potential capital gains rates for um, households that have over a million dollars going up to the ordinary rate of 39.6%. That's a really big one. Um, the other one out there that, is a little bit nuanced um, that would be very meaningful is something called the net investment income tax. It's a 3.8% Medicare um, surtax that right now, if you're active in your business, so all the active restaurant owners in there that are form formed as partnerships or S-corps, you don't pay this 3.8% tax. Well, if, this, if, if kind of the Biden plan goes through, you would. So that's another kind of little hidden increase there that I know is a little bit nuanced. That's um, somewhat in the press, but hard to understand. And then some estate and gift tax changes that would be favorable as well. So all those things together um, were part of the campaign trail, have been on the agenda of the Green Book. That's kind of the, the review of all this and what it means kind of economically and fiscally was pushed out last week. All these proposals I just ran through are in there. 
Um, it's kind of a matter of, of how far uh, we get to those potential answers. As far as when, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. We always disclaim, you know, can't predict the future here, but um, likely, you know, it would be something that would be, I think in 2022. Um, now there's there's some thought out there that, that President Biden put a stake in the ground, for example, on this capital gains change that it would be as of the date that he released the plan, which would be April 28th of this year. And retroactive tax law changes are, are somewhat are pretty remote, especially for something like that. Um, you know, I think from a from a practitioner standpoint, the likelihood is more 2022. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, who knows? And, right. and I think that all those headwinds, though, are absolutely driving people in terms of thinking of succession planning, potential, you know, if there's a sale or you know, family transfers, things that probably should have been on somebody's agenda or radar all along. It's now kind of fast forwarded it. Um, so we're seeing a lot of, uh, having a lot of conversations wrapped around all that. I know, you know, we are experiencing our biggest year ever in terms of M&A activity as a firm. Um, and we're not even halfway through the year yet. <laughs> and um, the, the capital gains is an issue for me in many ways because uh, when I, I know that I don't look like I'm 53, but I am 53 <laughs> years old and I've been doing this now for 30 years. And when I first started in business, capital gains tax rate was 28% mm -hmm. <laughs> and nobody moved, nobody sold anything. They didn't want to pay the taxes on it. And so going to 39.6%, which really isn't 396 because you add on all the other mm -hmm. surtaxes that go with it. Uh, I think it, it stops businesses. And, and so the uh it's interesting timing right now from uh for restaurants i think because there are spaces available there are restaurants that have gone out of business and there I, I believe there's opportunity and people are making you know decisions based on what could happen um and it's, it's just an interesting time right now I, I personally don't believe that the capital gains tax rates will go up to that uh, that rate or anywhere near it it seems uh, politically impossible you know i mean it seems politically rude, impossible like you said it's just right I think it's a negotiating point personally, but uh, I do believe corporate tax rates will go up uh, for sure. But I don't know that capital gains tax rates will go up at least that much. Yeah. So and corporate that, seems very vulnerable. Yeah, I agree. Rates. It's yeah. a nice word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I would say too, Randy, one of the things if you're trying to read the tea leaves, pay attention to what Joe Manchin's saying, or right. I think right. it's Kristen Cinema in Arizona, some of the more moderate Democrats, I think. Um, that could likely be where things wind up. Um, so we're paying attention to kind of what they're what they're saying about all this as well along the way. Do you guys think that there's any reason to change the way you operate your business because of this today? I I would say that if you're starting out, it's worth you know think about do you want to be a corporation or do you want to be a pass through entity, an LLC or S corporation even? Yeah, I mean you probably want to start with an LLC because the taxes are probably going to go back to right now. It's sort of neck and neck with the. 2017 tax changes, those are probably going to go away for corporations, like we just said. So that, you know, go back to a, a scenario where past news are tax advantageous, particularly in Ohio, we get big deductions. So right. that I think starting out, or if you have the ability to restructure without a big tax hit is worth considering. In terms of like the changes in the estate tax and that sort of thing that are longer term for more established businesses, I don't know, I'd be interested to hear if Cass has any thoughts on restructuring existing businesses to uh, sort of future proof them if that rate changes. Yeah, I, I think one of the big things, you know, restaurant industry or just industry in general, you know, just closely held businesses, I think people are really thinking long and hard about making big gifts uh, during this year with the potential of, you know, right now the current exemption is somewhere north of 11 million bucks or it's around 12 million bucks. Um, it, that would be uh, backed all the way down to a million dollars. So that's a huge difference. And so from that standpoint, we do have a lot of clients that are taking a hard look at their estate plan and um, potentially going to make some big gifts during this year to just make sure that they don't lose that that exemption. Yeah. Uh, personally, I don't think it happens. Uh, I, I don't I think that the, the state tax is it that already goes down in 2025. I just don't think it's politically worth the fight, but we'll see. Yeah, and it's I mean, it's really only gone up over the last 
20 plus years. That's right. Just that's right. The exemption keeps yeah. going up. Yeah, and if we were going to look back in time and if, if history can help us think about any of this, I mean, I remember back in, in 2012 when everybody thought the estate tax was going to go down, right. it actually went up yep. in 2013. And so, index so, inflation too. Right, right. So it's hard to say. I think the big thing that we're really just trying to get with our clients on is just do as much planning as possible, um, avoid surprises. And, you know, we can kind of, you know, we're, whatever the cards are that we're dealt, you know, we'll, we'll play the hand, but it just try to stay in front of things as much as possible and allow our uh, operators to operate and we can kind of handle them and advise them on these things. So let's go back to an exciting topic because that one's ready to put my eyes out here. Um, I don't find tax riveting. <laughs> Uh, I can make it riveting, but yeah, we're not in that environment. Um, let's talk about technology. Sure. Let's talk about where we think technology is going within the restaurant space. Yeah. Or hospitality space. And here's like here's my question. Yeah. I asked some of my friends. We have <clears throat> about 15 restaurant tour clients, and I ask this question regularly. So, will there be a day that I make my reservation online? and I place my order online in advance, I show up at the restaurant and I have a server bring out everything I asked for, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe a couple modifications along the way. And then when I'm ready to leave, I just leave. I don't have to wait for the check. I pay my bill on, online and I walk out the door. And the appeal to that is twofold. Uh, now, obviously this is not, this is not, for every restaurant, of course, this is a space, a piece of it. Sure. But it's it, it it's appealing from a restaurant tour perspective. It changes my labor market, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I know exactly what I have. It helps me with the inventory. And as a consumer, I don't have to deal with waiting. I can get you know I can go in, get the food I want, and leave. Is that day coming? That day's here. Um, in at least in our life, we uh, excluding, what, excluding airports. <laughs> well, excluding airports, yeah. <laughs> um, you know. So I didn't mention this on during the introduction, but we actually launched a brand uh, this past year called the Wizard of Zaw. It's a pizza concept uh, out of Clintonville. And um, this gentleman that we met, Spencer Saylor, uh, I guess he is the wizard, uh, the wonderful wizard. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, you know, basically think of his platform as a uh, digital reservation system for picking up pizzas. He makes 100 pizzas a day, no more, no less. And he's booked six weeks out. Wow. Um, so, you know, to your point, from a labor model, we know exactly what we need. From a revenue model, we know exactly where we're at for the next six weeks. And that's a revolving six weeks. So it's, it's, yeah. it's going. Um, and, you know, the reality is most people go pick up the pizza. They will either eat it in their car, they'll take it home, or we do have an outdoor patio for them to dine in. Um, and I think that is a unique kind of... Uh, do people really eat pizza in cars? <laughs> Is that yeah. true? Well, when you've been waiting six weeks for it, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, it, it's a really interesting model because it's it's very consistent. It's very strategic. You can plan. Um, it, uh, it it does kind of work on the supply and demand kind of scarcity model. You know, yeah. when it's gone, sure. it's kind of like barbecue. Um, and and it's it's really enjoyable for us because it allows us to innovate within that model. So yeah. you know, if we want to add ice cream in six weeks, we can do that. If we want to add pasta in six weeks, we can do that. I think ultimately where my mind goes when you ask the question is this experience economy that we've all grown to love, you know, especially recently, whether it's pins mechanical or it's, uh, you know, fusion, which is convenient, fresh, fast sushi, or if it's going to enjoy a soccer game, you know, on the land grant patio, I think, um, I think what dining is doing now and what you can expect to continue to see is there's going to be a multitude of ways to interact with a certain brand. So, for example, you know, over 50% of our revenue right now is coming from digital. Now, that's different types of digital, right? That's delivery, that's third party, that's in house delivery, that's our vans driving to your house or office, that's third party delivery, that's the Uber Eats and DoorDash of the world. There's order ahead pickup, there's curbside, there's, you know, uh, um, in digital catering, there's events. And then ultimately you can also come in and dine in our restaurant. And I think that what we're seeing is that uh, people are just much more savvy in all the multitude of ways that they can pull a lever to eat. So if it's convenient, you know, they, they have a point of sale system in their phone. 
if it's, you know, I want to dine and I want to be served. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of people craving that experience. They want to go, sure. you know, have the bottle yep. of wine poured at their table and, and, and taste it and have, you know, have the, the high level of service. And I think that you're also going to find, you know, people getting into a super exclusive type type role, maybe non-fungible, to- non-fungible yeah. token type roles where, you know, the, a restaurant that comes to mind is a Nashville called Catbird Seat. And it's a, it's a, you know, very limited plating. I think there's like eight reservations a night. Mm-hmm. Typically, you can only reserve two tables at once. It's at a food table. You watch everything that's made right in front of you. It's kind of like an itikaya from Japan. Um, but uh, I think you're going to see a lot more intimate approaches to dining too. So um, you asked what the future looks like. I think we're going to have everything we've always had, but I also think you're going to see a lot of creative creativity around how do we do super expensive, super limited servings, whether it's like in the Wizard of Zah model or the Catbird Seat model, where um, you know it's, it's high touch points, high high experience, um, and of course behind all that is the technology feature, which allows you to capture the customer data and and really uh, get strategic in in segmenting those types of experience. So for us. You know, we've even toyed around with doing like a super high end fusion restaurant. You know, it's like we'll bring in a, a sushi chef from Japan, it's under fusion, you know, and, and it's a super elevated fusion experience, um, which ultimately would give credibility to the rest of the sure. Yeah. Right. So, there, you know, there, I, I think there's a lot of creativity in the future in, in terms of, of dining. Uh, I, I do think that technology will, will ultimately be the funnel in which people experience, whether it's the reservations or through ordering. Um, but you know we we can we can be very strategic. We know who's gluten free now. We know who's vegan now, and we can create messaging around it. Who's going to drive the technology? Is the restaurant tours going to drive it, or are technology companies? It's a good question. I think it's a. I think it's, <laughs> there's this, there's this joke that the people who do lead the restaurant industry typically work for like POS company. You know, so I think that it is a hybrid approach where where you know there'll be an idea. With someone much smarter than me who can who can you know uh, who can develop a platform develop the technology ultimately i think that those the, the decisions that are made that ultimately make the technology valuable to the customers will, will come through operator feedback Got it. Um, but yeah you know, i don't think you're going to see a restaurant company that develops apps and you know really great apps and and uh search search Got it. yeah probably partnerships that's what i was yeah so i think we're in a stage now where we're seeing that across all industries where the center of all innovation for the last 20 years has been Silicon Valley for everything. But increasingly in different industries, we're seeing that things can't be innovated there because now we're taking technology out of just the realm of pure technology and applying it to actual applications like in restaurants or farms or whatever that don't have as much of a presence there necessarily, or at least not exclusively there in the case of restaurants. So I think you're going to see a lot more of the diffusion of technology being created all around the country uh, and around the world. And probably that's gonna look like partnerships with restaurants that say, you know, innovative restaurants that say, I know I need this exact thing, or I think I can use this exact thing. And then partnering with a technology company to actually innovate that as a standalone brand probably that sells to other restaurants. So not just exclusive to one restaurant. Uh, Although I I think you'll see some of that too, um, in-house just, like yeah. your own app developed from the ground up, but probably more of it's going to be partnerships that are sold to other restaurants. The, I can tell you that the, that the the operators, I believe, want at least the flexibility to manage the content within. So if it's a new menu item, if it's a new picture, if it's a new whatever, you know, I, I see white label kind of being, you know, a thing for a while, but you know, being able to manage within your own IT department or, or, or marketing department would be, would be great. Or ops you really want a lot of flexibility. <laughs> Shopify with e-commerce where the flexibility is exactly a yeah. ton of it. And so any any e-commerce entrepreneur can change what their site looks and works. And that, and, that, and I think e-commerce is a good word. I mean, restaurants historically are not e-commerce business, yeah. but they are today. And I think one thing too that I didn't mention about the futures, I don't think ghost kitchens are here to stay. I think it's interesting. I think they're gonna be very hard to staff. Who wants to go work in a shoebox? You know, Got it. with no windows. You know, from from a customer standpoint. You know, there was this whole farm to table movement. You know, we know where your food comes from. But right. now, where does your food come from? Does it come from a shoebox in a warehouse on, you know, right. you know, the, the industrial part of town? Right. 
Um, way so to, way to avoid an area of town. Back yeah, and I just think that that part. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's, that is where they're popping up. They're in old warehouses. Right, right. But, but um, yeah, I, I don't think there's enough of a touch point from a consumer standpoint to 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 make it work. I think it's too expensive. I think you can do, you know, I think that the ghost kitchens are, are, are asking far too much. And I think there's, you know, nobody wants to go to work in a, I mean, nobody that I want to have making my food is going to go to work in a warehouse, you know, serving food for right. a delivery driver who I don't know. Um, and so I would be surprised and maybe I'll eat crow on this one. Like we see ghost kitchens around Got uh, for a while. It just, it seems like a lose lose for everyone. So what I'm hearing you both say actually in some respects that technology Will can will be here for good, and it will innovate the experience. But it, but nobody's talking about creating labor efficiencies with it. it, it, uh, it, yeah, it you can't simulate food. I mean, in a way that I can think of. I mean, it, ultimately we're all going to leave here and go have lunch. You know. Yeah. And so twice. Yeah, right, twice. <laughs> <laughs> but, I will at least. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you, you you can't simulate it. You can't virtualize it. You can't put on a Oculus Rift and go eat. And so I think ultimately, uh, whether you're making food at home in your kitchen or you're, or you're dining, you know, at a fast casual fast food, QSR, FSR, any other subset niche restaurant, fine dining, casual dining, family dining, you name it, you know, it, it'll be here uh, in a way that I, that I hope, and this is just my utopian view, and I hope that is, you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, human to human, you know, uh, and, experience oriented whether that is you know ordering ahead or, or, or being served do you, do you think uh technology rewards everybody equally from the standpoint that a, a one or two location operator versus a three location operator is it is it, does it have uh favorites or do you think that those businesses that are bigger are going to be rewarded more with technology I think it's easier now than ever to get into the technology world. I mean, you're seeing POS companies basically sell add-ons to, to pretty inexpensive POS systems that allow for online ordering. You know, Square, Toast, NCR, Micros, all the players, you know, can get you into online ordering pretty pretty efficiently. Um, I, I think where the where the learning lesson for us, especially as we've grown and has come, is that it's not enough to just have it. You have to manage it. And so, you know, we're always looking at who are you know, the 80, 20, 20% 20 of our customers are paying 80% of our bills. So, you know, it's, we look at who is our most loyal customers. Um, I mean, we start there, who, you know, Randy, you spent a thousand dollars this year. Thank you so much. You know, we're going to reward you by giving you a Frisbee. We're going to reward you by giving you an extra meal on us. Um, I want the Stephen Harbin <laughs> NFT. Yeah, I <laughs> can sell it to you. Uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how you prove that you own it, but I can sell it. To I'll you. figure it out. But the, <laughs> but I, but I think that managing it is actually the skill set that, that that restaurants are going to have and can only afford when they started to grow uh, and can afford that overhead. But you know, I mentioned kind of in passing that we know who our vegan customers are now. We know who our gluten free customers are now. We know who pay who's eating for a family, and we know who's eating solo. We know the average age. We know you know, can segment in ways that allow us to inevitably, and maybe looking way into the future, you actually create personalized menus for Randy. You know, if, if I know Randy loves our tofu, let's just say, I'll only show Randy the tofu dishes Got it. or the vegetarian dishes. If I know that, you know, James loves steak, you know, I, I will show him a multitude of steak options uh, and he probably is not interested in the tofu. And so I, I think as, as, to get back to your question, as these larger unit, our larger chains grow, the management of that customer data will ultimately be kind of how you create that intimacy Got it. for people to order. And personalization, yeah, makes sense. I mean, so. I mean, you're even getting into things now where like you can take a 23 and me, it'll tell you your perfect diet yeah. and you can even right. make a menu for that. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Um, okay. So it is 9.53. Uh, do we have any questions? Do you see any questions up there at this point? Uh, yeah, so one question is, have you been following the momentum of restaurant and kitchen robotics companies right now in the market? And what does that look like? So we were just talking a little bit about you can't really replace humans for the hands-on stuff. To some extent, there are robotics companies that are trying to do that. But what does that look like now? Who asked, How that, far who out asked that question? I feel like they know us. 
The, <laughs> that was me. That was you. <laughs> the, 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 uh, yeah. So April 18th, or not April 18th, uh, June 18th is, uh, is National Sushi Day. Huh? So tomorrow, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so actually the robotics is interesting in that we're working with our, with one of our vendors. Uh, we started this business 11 years ago with sushi robots and we're still using them today. Um, uh, they don't replace people. Uh, they don't replace, uh, you know, they, they, they allow for consistency for us. Um, you know, basically the, the two time consuming things about sushi is, is portioning rice, laying it on the seaweed, you know, for rolls and anyway, for laying it on the seaweed cut it those are you know knife skills are are, are super keen um in, in sushi making so we did we we have used robots and automation to help with that um but at no point do we use robots to replace the human right um i i think getting back to my point about ghost kitchens yeah, right is there's still some craft to making food for sure know? yeah you, you, and, and every, every piece of beef is different, right? Every piece of chicken is different. You can't cook it exactly the same every time. Exactly. Unless you're you can't, you can't. Yeah. So, so cook the hell out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so to answer the question is, you know, we're going to continue using them because it's an important part of our of our business, um, and uh, and it allows us to uh, create consistency across not only day to day in each store, but across all the stores. Um, but uh, you know. It is fun to go to the restaurant shows the sure. now and see automate automated pizza makers. I don't know who's buying them, but you know, you go to Costco, you see that thing spinning with the sauce going on, and you know, it, I, I think that I think that you know, for the right application, it, it could work well. Yeah. I saw a little while ago that they had a delivery truck. I don't know if it flamed out or what, but it was pizza delivery, and it's made by machine in the truck. So you order it, and it's driving, making, cooking in the truck. <laughs> it gets to your house and pops out. You just grab the fresh made pizza. Interesting. Interesting. Whether it's good or not, is irrelevant. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's fresh. Freezer pizza. Yeah. So, uh, are there other questions? Uh, there is a question about: Do we have any statistics on the restaurant industry in terms of bankruptcies, struggling businesses, businesses in decent shape? Do we have any of that, those stats? I don't have them on me, but I can give a perspective just from our client base. We, we've had, I don't think we've had any restaurant clients that have gone out of business. I think I mentioned earlier, um, maybe shedding some locations that they probably should have shed before all this. And then the reality is, in a, in a number of our clients, um, with all the relief and ability to get new market loans, PPP, the, the funds, there's a, there's a handful of our clients that are actually come out of this thing stronger for sure and, and more properly capitalized um, than they were before this. So. Um, I, I do think that, uh, and I agree with you completely, Kaz, that it, with all the government programs, there's been, it's been uh, hard to go out of business, frankly, right? You know, uh, I do wonder, though, what happens a year from today or two years from today when there isn't so much government money and you really have to compete. Because I, like other things, I do believe that uh, uh, th those restaurants, restaurant tours that innovated and improved their product and serve their experience for this will, will do better. And in in a year or two from today, those that were weak and maybe got by because of government subsidies, etc., um, uh, they they won't be around in a year or two. So, but yeah, so that, no hard statistics, but I think it's I think it's too soon to to judge that at this moment. So, yeah, the, that's the only that was the last question. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Like once the life support's taken away, the ramification, like, who flames out, <laughs> who can keep up. And, I'm having conversations with our clients about what to do with this extra money, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's you know, cause it, a lot of them don't operationally need it. Uh, some do, but not many, many don't. And, um, and, you know, there's a big strong argument to make that we should have let it, let companies fail. Uh, you know, that America was built on creative destruction and entrepreneurism. And, and we took that away a year ago, but, that's we are where we are for so, the moment for the moment that's right mm -hmm. that's right it's a unusual circumstance yes so and so that's a justification i suppose but yeah. that's not going to go on very long right yeah so it's just it, it, i think i think the the true competition's yet to to really uh rear its, its face and it's still a year or two away so are you generally recommending that people who have that excess cash just hang on to it as a war chest in anticipation of this? Sort of For sure. I think that, um, I mean, we, we started this a year ago. I mean, 
if you go, go back and look prior to 9-11, okay, what crisis did we have in this country that wasn't self-inflicted? In other words, we, we entered wars that we chose to enter, right? But you have to go back a really, really long time to get to a crisis that we had. Yeah, right. And, and, and so, um, but we had 9-11 happen, right? And then we had the financial meltdown in 2008, and now we had this pandemic last year. And so as globalization is happening more and more and more, uh, I think we're going to have more crisis that are global crisis in nature. And, and I don't know what, I have no idea what it's going to be, but it's going to be different than we all expect, right? I mean, I poo-pooed the idea of a pandemic a few years ago, like it's impossible to happen because of medical technology. And here we are, because some guy ate a bat. Um, and allegedly, we don't know that guy, but <laughs> allegedly. So um, the, um, so I think that, and, and you know, the, the, the remedy of, of, of choice has been flood the, the market with money, right? In 08, we figured that out. And that's what, we, and so the, now we have this playbook, right? I don't know though, I mean, there's at some point in time, there will be some reconciliation around the government's ability to, I mean, it's just staggering to say, hey, two, two trillion here, two trillion there. That may not be the case in the future. And I think the only, you know, America still is built on capitalism. I, I believe that in my, in my uh, heart and soul. And I think the only remedy that you as a small business have is to have liquidity on your balance sheet. And ideally you have it on your personal balance sheet. So it's not some kooky issues around, you know, businesses having too much cash. And so, uh, yeah, I have, a, as you can tell, a very opinionated uh, position on this. And I think it's, I think it's absolutely necessary. And I think you're foolish to not put liquidity in your balance sheet as much as you possibly can and sit on it. Um, I think it's critical. Now it's not the time to be running lean and keeping cash out. No, so. you know, it's a it's balance, right? That, that I do believe there's opportunity to grow, you know, so, and, and we all know growth sucks cash, right? Mm -hmm. Growth costs capital. However, I don't think the idea of grow at the expense of not having liquidity is say, is a good idea. I think you have to figure out how to do both, which may mean you grow at slower rates. Yeah. Um, and and God forbid we have a crisis next year of some sort, right? I mean, it happens right now. And and yeah. you have a fatigue, uh, people are emotionally fatigued in this country and the labor force is fatigued and that, the, the, you know, the stress issue is very real. and. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we have to think about the, the what ifs here. And yeah. so uh, the only, the only is probably the wrong word, but the primary solution is liquidity on your balance sheet. So it'll, it'll, you can be opportunistic and or solve problems. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting, terrifying thought experiment. You know, what if there's a variant that's, that the vaccines don't prevent against and we're suddenly lurched back into where we were a few months ago. And how many businesses, like you said, the government can't continue. I don't think we could do another 15 months of $5 trillion of bailout. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, what if there's, I mean, think differently. What if there's a terrorist attack that shuts down our electric grid? Yeah. I mean, it could be, you know, uh, uh, yeah. you know or water, you know, we've got a water supply. You know, there's all sorts of things. Yeah, that, that oil pipeline thing. Was, oil pipelines yeah. really, you know, who would have thought a boat gets stuck in the Panama Canal would cause problems, <laughs> right? But that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And that's One boat. Fun. Yeah, global supply chain, you, you talk about globalization, but global supply chain, you know, really talk about rearing its head. It's like, oh, yeah, we are dependent on all, I mean, from a restaurant standpoint, especially, you know, a, a restaurant that uses so much Japanese specialty food. You know, it's like, yeah, that, you know, seaweed probably not. You're not getting your fish out of Lake Erie? No, thank oh. God. No. Fuck out of Lake. Fuck out of Lake. No, but, you know, it's just, I mean, everything from, from you know, sesame oil to, you know, luckily our rice is grown domestically, and but we are now even thinking, what can we, what can we get closer to home? Yeah. You know? So I mean, you're in a unique situation with what you, what you do. I will say that why I get excited about where America's going, is that the supply chain is coming back to America. I mean, you know, we had the energy prices in in 05, 06, 07 initiated this whole thing, right? And now COVID just exacerbated it, and with so much innovation and technology. You're seeing more and more companies bring the supply chain back and this, and this automation and robotics and so i'm excited about where we're going um it just globalization is going to continue to throw us curveballs so yeah. and there's some things that can't be brought back home 
We need to start serving carp. I think. Yeah, they, I mean, that's <laughs> robust perch. <laughs> uh, all right, well, guys, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, for those of you that joined us, I really appreciate uh, joining us. And for those of you who didn't, you really missed out on some really good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I and thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. And uh, Andy, I hope you're going to shut us down now. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. We're still alive. I can see the owl working. That thing's pretty cool. It is cool. Um, and it, yeah, there we go.